Top of the morning to you, my loves. <laughs> I'm glad to see you celebrating by the wearing of the green and not the drinking of the beer yet. <laughs> Welcome to Potassa United Methodist Church. We have a lot of things going on, and I'll name a few. Once I can catch my breath, I'm getting too old for this. The spring cleanup day will be held on Saturday, March 23rd. Coffee and donuts will be available at 8.30 a.m. and work will begin at 9 a.m. and wrap up at noon. The trustees need help with several tasks that include sit-down jobs, jobs outside and inside to prepare the church for the Easter season. The Pataskala Easter egg hunt will also be held on that Saturday at Foundation Park from 1 to 4 p.m. Our church circuit will have a Monday Thursday service on March 28th at 7 p.m. in Kirkersville, UMC. Pastor Terry and Carl will be helping with communion, and Pastor Chris Wiseman from Summit Station will be preaching. Our church circuit will then have the Good Friday service on March 29th at 7 p.m. at Summit Station, and Pastor Carl will be preaching. Plan to join us on Easter Sunday. All are welcome. There will be a sunrise, S-O-N-R-I-S-E, worship service at 7 a.m., breakfast at 8 a.m., worship at 9.30 a.m., brunch at 10.30 a.m., <laughs> and an Easter egg hunt at 11 a.m. An email was sent out this week for help during these events. Please sign up if you are able. In addition, we will be taking complimentary family photos at the back of the sanctuary on Easter. Photos will be taken in front of a neutral backdrop, and we can't wait to see everyone in their Sunday best. And next week, believe it or not, next week is Palm Sunday. Um, our uh, Sarah is working very diligently to get a special surprise. So please check your emails this week. Maybe we'll have it lined up Monday, but please check your emails this week. If you're not on our email list, if you haven't been receiving emails from the church, contact me because it is a very awesome surprise if we can manage it. So please be praying that we can get that worked out. And if you're not on our list, talk to me after the service so you can get on the list. Because trust me, if it, get, if it works out, you want to be here. Okay. Welcome, beloved congregation, to our worship service this morning. It is a great honor and it is a joy to be your pastor. This morning, we celebrate the profound unity of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We also embrace the call to go forth and make disciples of all nations. May the grace of our triune God be with you as we journey together in faith and obedience. The centering thought is by Richard J. Vincent about the practicality of the Trinity. The Trinity reminds us that relationships matter. Our relationship with God and with others should reflect the unity, love, and community found within the Godhead.
Would you please stand as we do the call to worship based on Psalm 8 this morning? O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouths of babes and infants, you have established strength because of your foes to still the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is humanity that you are mindful of us? You have given us dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under our feet. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set the glory above the heavens. Will you join me in our opening hymn, number 580, Lead On, O King Eternal. <laughs> At this time, I will pray for us. Gracious and triune God, as we gather in your presence today, we thank you for the privilege of being called into your kingdom work. Grant us the wisdom to understand your word, the courage to proclaim it, and the compassion to live it out in our daily lives. May your Holy Spirit guide us as we seek to fulfill the great commission and bring glory to your name. You may be seated.
allow me to pray for us. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, perfect unity, blessed Trinity, we worship you this day, finding ourselves in need of direction, of sound judgment, and of grace. That unity of being seems so far removed from our experience with one another in this world, particularly in recent days. We cry out, save us, O God, without pausing to remember that you have already done all that is needed for our salvation, for our unity. You sent both a cure for our selfishness and an example for our love, a release from our bondage to our sinful ways and a pathway to wholeness. You sent Jesus to teach us love, not just in word, but in deed. It is not you who will say it is not you who will not save. It is we who refuse to embrace your word made flesh and your spirit to guide our flesh in all ways. Forgive us, we humbly pray, for our many sins. For we have not thought as we should. We have not spoken words of hope and kindness. We have not acted in obedience to your law of love. Grant us the grace of true repentance, that we might judge ourselves rather than our neighbors, our fellowship rather than those who differ from us. Have mercy upon us, we pray. Place before us the image of your triune holiness, where perfection of love is to be found. Then remind us that this is the God whose image we are made, and this is the pattern into which we are joined by your Spirit through the works of Christ alone. And so we seek justice, we seek truth, we seek mercy that triumphs over judgment. We seek humility that serves, kindness that heals, and love that binds people in heart and mind. We seek your kingdom in the midst of chaos. And so as your people, we continue to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As we reflect on the boundless love and generosity of our triune God, let us respond with grateful hearts by offering our tithes and offerings. Through our giving, may we tangibly demonstrate our commitment to advancing the kingdom and sharing the good news of salvation to the ends of the earth.
Almighty God, we dedicate these gifts to you, knowing that you can multiply them beyond measure for the fulfillment of your purposes. May our offerings be used to spread the gospel, nurture discipleship, and alleviate the suffering of those in need. Bless these resources and empower us to be faithful stewards of your blessings. Amen. You may be seated. I hope you're awake now. <laughs> Allow me to pray for us. Holy Spirit, illuminate our minds and our hearts as we delve into your word. Grant us insight, understanding, and inspiration that we may be transformed by the truth we encounter. Guide us in applying your teaching to our lives that we may walk in the light of your wisdom. Amen. Our scripture reading is from the book of Matthew, chapter 28, verses 
16 through 20. It's the end of the book of Matthew. Hate to spoil the ending, but I think we've all heard it before. Or many of us have. If not, it's a good ending. Here it is. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of every nation, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I'm sure you've heard that passage before, or maybe you've heard part of it. Very oftentimes, I use it for the benediction at the end. And surely, Jesus will be with you always to the very end of the age. In my opinion, it is one of the greatest promises that God gives us in Scripture. That Jesus will not leave us or abandon us. I can't think of any better words of assurance than the promise that Jesus will be with you always, even to the end of the age. This is often called the Great Commission, the parting instructions, the last words of Jesus in his ministry on this earth before he ascends into heaven. And it says that we don't know how the fut- what the future holds, but we know who holds the future. Have you ever heard of uh, Maywin Sukkot? Anyone ever heard of him? You might. Uh, he was born in Britain, and then at the age of 16, he was captured by Irish pirates and was sold as a slave in Ireland, and he worked for six years as a shepherd. He came to Christ, and then he escaped back to Britain. He studied to become a priest. And that's where he got the name Patrick. And he went to Ireland. When I think of Patrick, I think of two things. The Trinity and missions. And guess what this scripture is addressing? The Trinity and missions. Among all things, among other things. The Trinity and missions. Beloved, as a church, we are to be about mission work. We are thankful to have a wonderful mission to chair, and we are looking. And we need you to step up to fulfill that role too. We need another missions chair in 2025, so I'm looking for someone in this congregation to take that step up to lead us in missions in this community because we do so much. And it might be scary to do mission work, But what does Jesus promise? I will be with you always to the very end of the age. You think of Patrick going back into Ireland, the place where he was a slave for six years. Can you imagine the terror, the uncertainty, the fear? What if someone figured out who he was and recaptured him? But yet he knew Christ was with him. Christ was before him. Christ was behind him. Christ was in all things. And he knew that if Jesus would be with him always to the very end of the age, then nothing, no weapon of the enemy could ever stand against him. Beloved, the key point of the sermon today is the mission of the United Methodist Church. It's the mission statement. Does anyone know the mission statement? Okay. To make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. Correct. Good job. (laughs) To make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. Uh, One of our kiddos uh, wrote this to me, and I think summarized my job really well. Dear Pastor Carl, you help us to learn about Jesus, and then we get to go home. (laughs) Amen. It's the greatest job in the world. And beloved, this passage calls each and every one of us to teach about Jesus Christ, even in our home. (laughs) Jesus calls us 
to transform the world. Chuck Swindoll once said, whatever we do, we must not treat the Great Commission like it's the Great Suggestion. Beloved, one of our goals, I used to not be a big fan of social media, and then I came to this church and I learned how powerful it can be. That's one of the many things you've taught me in just these brief months here. But what social media, what emails, and what snail mail, it's a bunch of invites. We, and our events are lots of invites where we invite people not just to eat some donuts and coffee, though they are amazing, but to hear about Jesus, to learn about Jesus and then to go home. That is the goal. It, it, our Facebook posts, our emails, just our conversations, their invitations to learn more and more about Jesus Christ. And that's not just the pastor's job. That's not just the mission chair's job. That's all of us. Jesus didn't tell his disciples, hey, only two of you should make disciples. He says, go into all the world. Into all the world. We're told in verse 17, they see Jesus again and some worshipped him while others doubted. Notice they worshipped him. The full honor of worship. The worship that you would give to God, they give to Jesus. And Jesus doesn't say, get up, don't worship me. No, he receives their worship. Showing that indeed he is God in human flesh. But we're told some doubted. We don't know why they doubted. Jesus doesn't yell at them for doubting, by the way. I believe there were many questions in the disciples' mind. Maybe a reflection that might be going on in our minds as we pray to Jesus, talk to Jesus, as we worship Jesus here today. Maybe the disciples thought, will Jesus forgive us? <laughs> uh, we, you know, earlier in the week, we betrayed Jesus. Will he forgive us? Was this really Jesus? Will we actually make a difference in this world? I'm sure there was a lot of joy, but I'm sure there was also a lot of doubt, a lot of questioning. And so the words of Jesus address that. He consoles them. And what is the greatest thing you can say to console the disciples of Christ? He says what? I have all authority. All authority has been given to me. Not just some authority. Not just partial authority. He says, all authority has been given to me. In heaven and on earth. Jesus has power over every enemy. Jesus has power over every dominion, over, over every nation. As it says in Colossians, Jesus holds the universe together over all the cosmic bodies and over every single subatomic particle, over weather and over governments. And that is why we can have confidence in carrying out Jesus' instructions. Go into all the world and make disciples of every nation, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded. He says, go into all the world. And indeed, the early church did that. They went into every corner of the world, of the known world at that time. And then the gospel spread into here, in North America, and then South America, and all over Asia, Europe, Africa. The gospel is making its rounds throughout the entire world. And that is what we are called to do. We are called to share the gospel. Now, that doesn't mean we should get on a boat and go, though some may be called. Though some may be called to be missionaries into another continent. But in fact, we are all called to be missionaries in our homes, with our family, with our circle of friends. I believe it was Spurgeon who said, every Christian is either a missionary or an imposter. We are called to represent Jesus into all the world. And one of the greatest places is the home. Jesus says 
not teach them. He says, teach them to obey my commandments. It's one thing to teach the commandments. It's another thing to teach them to obey. If you're going to teach someone to obey a commandment, it's not a do as I say, not as I do kind of thing, right? To teach someone to obey the commandments of Jesus, you have to live them out too. You have to live them out as well. I can think of many examples in my family. People wonder, well, Pastor Carl, you're so young to be a pastor. Well, it's because my family modeled how to be a Christian, what to believe, how they made decisions by putting Jesus first. Rebecca Merkel says, the home is actually one of the most strategic and important tools by which the world will be won. I think, I don't know about you, but when I hear you know, someone says they're a missionary, you think, oh, well, what country did you go to? What languages did you have to learn to speak? Beloved, our house is a mission field. May we be called to transform that. We are called to bear light into all the world. And I can think of many examples in my life when I worked at another job in after school Bible study at Patascala Elementary. It is a blessing to share the good news into all the world. And you might think, well, Pastor Carl, I only know six people. You know, I, I might only know, you know, two, three people. But if you think about it, humanity is kind of like dominoes. Now, if I were less clumsy, I would have set out dominoes and knocked them down. But I know with our powerful, strong organ, we might have knocked them down preliminarily before the sermon. So we all... We're like dominoes, right? We're one domino in the whole tapestry of humanity. And so I might might affect only 10 people, and then you might affect another 10, and so on and so forth. We are just one domino in a whole tapestry of dominoes. And you never know how much just you being you can affect people. I remember... (laughs) One time, my friend and I, we were at a gas station. And the gas station employees were not in the best of attitudes. And I just smiled and said, hey, have a good day. Talk to them about the weather a little bit. And my friend goes, you know, I bet you the attitude in that gas station probably increased just because you smiled and greeted them. That might have been the first time they got a smile today. Beloved, the same is true in sharing the good news of Jesus. I remember when I was really young, hearing on the radio in my dad's 1991 Ranger, someone saying they never heard the Easter message before. I couldn't believe it as a young little kid. There are people who never heard the Easter message before, that Jesus died for sins and rose again. And dad said, yeah, that's true. There are some people, they might have heard it a hundred times, but if you tell them it, It's different. We are called to plant seeds. And maybe perhaps because you are so involved in a person's life, when you tell them the gospel, they'll actually take it for real and seriously consider it. You never know how many other dominoes you affect in this life. We are called to make disciples. We're called not just to make converts, a simple shallow faith. We're not called to make buddies. The church is more than a social club. Our goal is for people to believe in Jesus and to be like him. Jesus is not promising that you'll get everything right. And that's okay. You never know how Jesus will even use your imperfections to get the gospel across to someone. But we all need Jesus because we're all not Jesus. As the band Casting Crowns says, I'm just a nobody trying to tell everybody about somebody who saved my soul. Jesus says, go into all the world and make disciples of every nation. This isn't a heritage thing. This isn't a lineage thing. We are to make disciples of the entire world. 
And then what's his second command? Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. I think the beauty of baptism, it's it's some special groups require that you you have to write down a long list of beliefs or you have to pass a test or you have to get a cool tattoo or learn a special handshake. (laughs) In Christianity, if you have a head, you can come in. You're welcome in to be baptized into the church. The baptism is a sign of an inward grace that God has done something in your life. That is how we mark people into the church. And Jesus says, baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. As United Methodists, we have our elders Our pastors perform baptism to make sure it is legitimate. Um, But Jesus doesn't say just pastors baptize, though we need to make sure when it occurs, it needs to be done appropriately. And notice how Jesus institutes baptism. He says, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. we see the three in one statement. The three are equal. It's a beautiful sign of the Trinity that you are marked for God by the work of God the Father, by the work of God the Son, and by the work of God the Holy Spirit. As United Methodists, we recognize every Trinitarian baptism. It's beautiful in the Trinity when Patrick taught it many, many, many hundreds of years ago, he used the clover as the example of the Trinity. Now, our astute theologians will note, any analogy of the Trinity falls short, given that. But we see that there is one clover, and then there are three parts in it. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Father is God, the Son is God, the Spirit is God. But the Father is not the Son, the Son is not the Spirit, the Spirit is not the Father. They're one in being and three in person. One being, three persons. That is the Trinity. I've seen people from all kinds of age ranges, all kind of learning backgrounds understand the Trinity. Sometimes it takes more work. Sometimes it takes a variety of teaching. If you do not understand the Trinity, come to me. I will help you understand it because the Trinity is so important to us as Christians. It's what makes us Christians. It's one of the things that makes us distinct. We believe God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. We don't believe in three gods. We believe in one God who's complex in unity. Three persons, three centers of intellect. Well, why is that important, Pastor Carl? (laughs) That's so esoteric. That's so conceptual. Why would Patrick teach the Trinity? Well, I think one of many, many reasons is that before God created the universe, we say God is love. In order to love, there needs to be an object of love, an object receiving love. When I say I love my wife, she's the one who receives the love. And before the universe was created, what did God love? The Father loved the Son. The Son loved the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit loved the Father. It's an inter-triune love. Three in one. They loved each other before the universe was created. Only in the Trinity can you understand God as always loving forever and ever. And out of the outpouring of that inner love, The universe was created. We see the love of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Father, we call the Father because that person in the Trinity adopted us, declares us forgiven. How can we be declared forgiven when we have fallen so short? Well, that is the work of God we call the Son, who chose to come to earth to live a perfect life and to die for us. It's important that Uh, Jesus, we consider God in human flesh because that is the physical and spiritual connection we have to God. Because if we say Jesus is just a creation, well, then we can say God could have created something better. 
And then we have God the Holy Spirit, which applies the work of Jesus to each and every life. When we believe in Jesus, God the Holy Spirit applies that work to us. And it's important that we consider the Holy Spirit God because we can't control the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit uses us. You know, we see Jesus when he was tested in the wilderness, the Holy Spirit led him there, directed him. Uh, The Apostle Paul was guided by the Holy Spirit. He didn't make God conform to him. You might have heard, well, no, you probably have never heard of them. The pneuma notions, uh, pneumatomachians, there it is, pneumatomachians. That's a cool transformer name. (laughs) <laughs> but they didn't believe that the Holy Spirit was God. And Basil of Caesarea, what did he do? He pointed to this very verse showing that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are co-equal and co-eternal. They work together. We're told the Holy Spirit searches the mind of God. Well, to know the mind of God, you have to be God. No one else can have that infinite knowledge. We, as Christians, have the mind of Christ, that incarnational knowledge. And then we are told the very last words of Jesus. The early church would have read this big scroll. The book of Matthew would have been the largest scroll in all of the New Testament. And here we get to the end. I will be with you always to the very end of the age. We have the mind of Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. You might have heard the saying, we live for the hereafter. In old age, you come here and you forgot what came after. But beloved, as Christians, we live here on this life, but we also live for what comes after. We believe that God is always at work. That Jesus is indeed Lord of our life. And I'll end with the words of John Chrysostom, John Goldenmouth. He says, Jesus reminds his disciples of the consummation of all things. He seeks to draw them further on, that they may not look at the present dangers, but also at the good things to come that last forever. He's in fact saying, these difficult things that you will undergo are soon to be finished with this present life. So let us not fear and shudder. Let us repent while there is opportunity. Let us rise out of our sins. We can by grace if we are willing. Beloved, may we go into all the world and make disciples of every nation, teaching them to obey the commandments of Jesus. For Jesus will be with us always to the very end of the age. Amen. Will you please stand if you're able and sing 581, Lord Whose Love Through Humble Service.
I also can't find my words. There it is. <laughs> May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit abide with you now and forevermore. As you go forth to make disciples of all nations, may you be strengthened by the unity and power of the Trinity, shining brightly as lights into the world. Amen.